On May 22, 1856, violence broke out in the United States Senate the likes of which had never been seen before and have not been seen since. Preston Brooks, a South Carolinian congressman, stormed into the Senate room where Charles Sumner, a senator from Massachusetts, was writing and stamping letters. While his colleague, Lawrence Keat, held back several other senators with a gun, Brooks beat Sumner near to death with his walking cane. Both Brooks and Sumner, after the attack, were hailed as heroes in their respective halves of the nation, and within five years, the passions of this incident would lead up to the Civil War. In 1819, the United States consisted of only 22 states, 11 free and 11 slave. When Missouri petitioned for entry into the Union as a slave state, Congress knew that allowing the entry would upset this delicate balance. Under the leadership of Henry Clay, a compromise was made, the unexpectedly named Missouri Compromise. Missouri would be allowed into the Union as a slave state, and Maine would be as well, but as a free state. Most importantly, the Louisiana Purchase land was divided so as to limit the spread of slavery. No state formed above the southern boundary of Missouri would be allowed to enter the Union as a slave state. With the help of the Missouri Compromise, the balance between slave and free states was maintained for nearly 40 years. However, in 1854, the passage of the Kansas-Nebraska Act threatened to destroy it. The Kansas-Nebraska Act was proposed by a senator from Illinois, Stephen Douglas who wanted to build a northern transcontinental railroad, but needed Nebraska land in order to do so. He proposed that both states be entered under popular sovereignty. Douglas himself supported popular sovereignty, but didn't care much either way about slavery in the new territories. His act, however, proposed that Kansas or Nebraska might be allowed entrance as slave states, despite both states falling above the Missouri Compromise line. This disregard for the compromise sparked a violent and controversial conflict that came to be known by the ominous name of Bleeding Kansas. Pro-slavery border ruffians, as well as anti-slavery free soilers, gathered in Kansas, determined to swing the slavery election in their own favor one way or another. While Kansas itself was primarily anti-slavery, in the end the government was voted pro-slavery, and a vicious constitution was created. The Free Soilers established their own opposing free government in Lawrence, writing up their own constitution and attempting to enter the Union. On May 21, 1856, a force of 800 Kansas and Missouri pro-slavery men attacked the Free Soilers in Lawrence, burning the newspaper offices and inns. No one was killed, but the riots infuriated many Free Soilers, such as the Massachusetts Senator Charles Sumner. Charles Sumner was a prominent civil rights activist and abolitionist, and had been since the late 1840s. He had worked to reform prisons and schools, fought to integrate schools, and had been elected to the Senate as a free soiler. He was often accused of being too extreme, and he showed it now. On May 22nd, only a day after the attack on Lawrence, Charles Sumner took the floor to deliver a vitriolic and obscene speech entitled, Crime Against Kansas. Not in any common lust for power did this uncommon tragedy have its origin, he said. It is the rape of a virgin territory, compelling it to the hateful embrace of slavery. In his speech, he targeted two senators specifically, Stephen Douglas of Illinois and Andrew Butler of South Carolina. Butler was not present the day of Sumner's speech, but that didn't stop him from publicly trashing him. The senator from South Carolina has read many books of chivalry, and believes himself a chivalrous knight, with sentiments of honor and courage. Of course he has chosen a mistress to whom he has made his vows, and who, though ugly to others, is always lovely to him, though polluted in the sight of the world, is chaste in his sight. I mean the harlot slavery. Supposedly, during Sumner's speech, Stephen Douglas leaned over to a colleague and said, that damn fool will get himself killed by some other damn fool. Sumner did manage to survive giving an aggressively anti-slavery speech to Congress, but just barely. Butler may not have been there to hear the speech, but his cousin, Preston Brooks, was a representative, and he took it upon himself to defend his family's reputation. 
When Brooks went to his colleague, Lawrence Keat, for dueling advice, Keat reminded him that duels were for honorable men of equal status. Brooks agreed and decided to beat Sumner with his walking cane instead, like he would a dog. The Senate had adjourned for the day when Brooks went to Sumner's desk, where the Senator was writing and stamping letters. The senator didn't have a chance to stand before Brooks began beating him brutally with his walking cane, trapping him against the desk. Several other senators rushed to help him, but Keat drew a gun and held them back. Brooks did not stop until his cane broke. The fallout of the attack was tremendous. In the North, rallies were held, and many spoke out in support of Sumner and in condemnation of slavery. They felt that this proved, once and for all, that the South could not accept civility or free speech. In the South, hundreds of people sent Brooks new walking canes, one carved with the words, hit him again. They were glad to see abolitionists finally put in their place. It took Sumner three years to recover from his attack, and while he would spend many more years fighting for civil rights, he would suffer brain damage and trauma for the rest of his life. For those three years, his state continued to vote him to the Senate, keeping his seat empty in protest. Both Brooks and Keat were censured by the Senate, but the massive power divide between Northerners and Southerners kept either from being expelled. Brooks and Keat both resigned, and were re-elected almost immediately. Brooks was fined $300 for his assault on Sumner. It was the animosity between North and South that led to this violent attack, but this attack also led to an increase in the animosity between North and South. Northern anti-slavery free soilers and Republicans came together in horror to demand something be done about this harlot slavery while Southern pro-slavery Democrats found power in what they saw as a victory against abolition. The previous policies of quietly matching power were over. The problem of slavery had been growing ever larger over the years since the founding of the Union, but it was with the caning of Charles Sumner that it exploded, and became a problem so large it could only be addressed by a civil war. This enormity vast beyond comparison, swells to dimensions of crime which the imagination toils in vain to grasp, when it is understood that for this purpose are hazarded the horrors of intestine feud, not only in this distant territory, but everywhere throughout the country. The muster has begun. The strife is no longer local, but national. Even now, while I speak, portents lower in the horizon, threatening to darken the land which already palpitates with the mutterings of civil war.